about semi-random models. Thanks a lot, Andrea, and thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great workshop so far, and uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about using semi-random models to argue about robustness for a couple of unsupervised learning problems, uh, dictionary learning or sparse coding, and uh, clustering mixtures of Gaussians, uh, which you've seen already in this workshop. So these are both based on joint works with Pranjal Agasti, who's at Rutgers University. Uh, as this audience probably knows very well already, uh, probabilistic models are extremely popular when you are trying to uh, find structure in unlabeled data, and mixtures of Gaussians are used for clustering points, LDA is used for topic modeling, and so on and so forth. And here we generally assume that we are given data that is generated from this nice model, this ideal model, and you want to design an algorithm that either estimates the parameters, estimates the density, and so on and so forth. And uh, so this is the vanilla setup. And of course, I mean, the advantages of this kind of probabilistic modeling is that there's a very well-defined ground truth or a planted solution. And uh, you can develop a very rich theory around it about identifiability, getting efficient algorithms, and, and so on. But of course, the disadvantage is that real data very rarely comes from this kind of an idealized model. And uh, often, the kind of algorithms that people design are not necessarily robust to model misspecification and errors. And I guess that's the whole point of this workshop. Uh, and uh, I guess the main point of my talk, in some sense, is to, is to promote semi-random models as maybe a different way of reasoning about robustness for many of these problems. I mean, semi-random models have been studied a lot in computer science and perhaps are not as uh, popular in statistics or in machine learning, and maybe these are a good way to reason about robustness for many of these problems. So what are semi-random models? So uh, what is usually done in statistics or machine learning is that you have a generator model for the instance, and your instance is very well defined. I mean, it's completely defined. The generation process is completely defined by the model. Uh, for instance, mixtures of Gaussians produces a bunch of points that you want to cluster. Of course, the parameters are uh, not known, and that's the goal. But it's, uh, the generation process is completely defined by the model. On the other end, if you are talking about a, a, a task like clustering, uh, in the worst case, you would assume nothing about the points, and you want a computationally efficient algorithm for solving uh, a certain clustering problem. And often, these problems tend to be NP-hard. So what are semi-random models? Semi-random models are things that lie in between the two. Okay, so. Uh, so there are random choices in the generation, but there are also some adversarial choices. Okay, so I guess you could think of this two-faced character in uh, Batman as an uh, analogy. But really, there are these uh, random choices, but these adversarial choices allow you to uh, put in more structure into the instance. Okay, for instance, uh, if you look at uh, addition any graphs as a good random model for your problem. Addition any graphs don't have things like large cliques or dense subgraphs and so on. But you can put in more adversarial choices to allow for this kind of a structure, which is usually seen in real world graphs. And seven random models were studied first by Blum and Spencer, and they studied this in the context of coloring. Uh, but there have been a wide variety of uh, semi-random models, uh, depending on the kind of adversarial choices that you allow. Okay? And um, I mean, in this generality, um, you, know, you can capture many, many different models. For instance, you could even capture things like the epsilon contamination model or the Huber model that you studied. And in fact, some of these works do do this for some, some of these combinatorial problems. And some of these semi-random models are more general. They talk about general properties of average case problems, uh, sorry, average case models, which will allow you to prove algorithmic guarantees. But in this talk, I'll focus on a one particular family of semi-random models. And these are what are known as monotone adversaries, monotone adversary models. Okay, so here, your semi-random model is really a generator model plus this monotone adversary. And what is this monotone adversary? So first, you draw your instance from the usual pure generator model. And then this adversary can come and then modify the instance, but only in a way that's helpful. Okay, so we saw one example uh, for the case of matrix completion and wrong stock. But then you could do various other, uh, I mean, you have various other uh, models for different problems. And, 
And the goal is that you want to identify, I mean, why do you want to study these seven other models or monotone adversary models? You want to identify robust algorithms that are not too tailor-made for the problem. Okay, so too tailor-made for the model. Uh, so these are choices that are helpful in some ways, but you, don't, you want to identify algorithms that are uh, robust and not uh, too tailor-made for the model from things that are not robust. Okay. Uh, so you could think about these monotone adversaries as, I mean, being of two different kinds. I mean, these are the kinds that have been studied. In the first kind, you could think about these monotone adversaries as improving some kind of a planted solution. Okay, so this is a little more vague, but you know, let me give you an example of it. Uh, so here, uh, you know, you, are, you have this generator model. Uh, for instance, you could think about a mixture of Gaussian for clustering or a stochastic block model for partitioning or community detection. And so you have you know, these clusters which are not known to you, and there are many more edges inside these clusters than between these clusters. Uh, and now a monotone adversary can come and either add edges inside the clusters or delete edges between the clusters. Okay. Now, why is this a monotone adversary? Because really your goal was not about learning the generator model. Your goal was doing this task of partitioning. And these changes that you do are only making the planted partitioning even better. Okay, so these kind of monotone adversaries improve the planted solution. And uh, this was studied by, I mean, this was first studied by Feige Killian for uh, graph partitioning, and then there have been other works for various other clustering problems. Okay, and often you can show that semi definite programming uh, is robust to these kind of monotone adversaries. Okay. Whereas uh, certain other algorithms, uh, it's hard to reason about what they do when, I mean, uh, when you have these kind of monotone adversaries. Has yes. this been proved for weak recovery in the SPM? So that's a good question. So um, I, there is this result by Moitra. Uh, they don't prove that SDP is robust. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. So, okay, good. So when I say uh, they are robust, I guess. It's often in the con I mean, it's often when you are willing to tolerate some slack in the constants uh, for recovery. So, yes, it's not true. It's not clear that it will actually hit the recovery limit that you can do when um, I mean so for weak recovery. But no, it's clear. It's known that it doesn't achieve. Okay, but it's not known whether there is, there is some other lost. algorithm. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Okay, so I'm not sure about the weak recovery regime, but in the exact recovery exact regime, recovery, yeah, this is, this is well understood. Yes, I think some of these problems are not as well understood for things like the weak recovery regime and certain other regimes. Yeah, that's a good question. They seem to be robust. They seem robust. Ah, see. Oh, okay, that's always, yeah, that's always a disclaimer of seeming, yeah. Okay, good. So the second type of a monotone adversary model is where you actually provide more information. Okay, and that's the kind of model that uh, uh, Rong was mentioning. So here you have this hidden signal or planted solution, and your monotone adversary just gives you more information okay, about this hidden signal. So one example could be compressive sensing, where you have this hidden k-sparse vector, and you see random measurements of these, this k-sparse vector. And if you get k log and random linear measurements, you can, of course, uh, recover this k-sparse vector. Okay, and there are many algorithms to do this. But what if you are given more information? Okay, these are not random linear measurements. These are potentially adversarial linear measurements. But it is only more information. So it should only help you. Okay, so linear programming, you can show that L1 minimization, linear programming works because the same dual proof will go through. You have more constraints, you can choose to neglect those dual variables. Okay, but it's not clear that a lot of the other algorithms, iterative heuristics work. Okay, and... Um, Another example is matrix completion again, which Rong talk, uh, talked about. Here you have a matrix which is low rank. If you're given random entries, uh, we know that there are many algorithms that work. What if you're given more entries adversarially? And uh, it's, it's, it's again easy to show that convex relaxations work, but alternating minimization is a different story, and Rong talked about it in the previous talk. Okay, so these are two kinds of monotone adversaries that have been studied. And I think these are nice ways of reasoning about robustness for many of these problems. And in this talk, we look at a couple of other semi-random models. And here, we will talk about uh, these semi-random models in the context of dictionary learning, 
and clustering mixtures of Gaussians, these are two problems where convex relaxations have not been as successful. And so it seems more challenging. Okay, um, uh, the seven hundred models seem more challenging in these contexts. Okay, good. So, any questions so far? Okay. So, the first problem that we look at is dictionary learning. Uh, so, some of you may be familiar with this problem, but let me just introduce it so that we are all on the same page. So, this is a very popular uh, statistical model when you are doing representation learning, for instance. So, the main idea is that. Uh, Data, high dimensional data is often sparse when you look at it in the right basis, in the right over complete basis. And so uh, it's extremely useful in when you are doing feature extraction or finding nice representations and so on. So what's the mathematical problem? You're given as input a matrix Y. Okay, you should really think about the columns of Y as the vectors, uh, columns of Y are the samples that are given to you. So there are S samples of dimension N each. And the way you have generated these vectors, these columns of y, is as follows. So there is this hidden basis, or dictionary A, that you care about. Okay? And it's overcomplete in the sense that there are more columns than the dimension. M is larger than N, typically. Okay? And what you are given are random sparse combinations of these columns of A. Okay? So and I've just drawn two columns here, but we can draw all these columns. And they are all sparse. And there are, I mean, so there's randomness in this generation. So there's randomness both in where the non-zero entries are and in the values of these non-zeros, typically. Okay. So now you are, you don't know a, you don't know x, you're only given y. Okay. And the goal is to find a and x when you're given y. Okay. So suppose you were given a, and if you were given y, then recovering each column of x really corresponds to compressive sensing. But here, you are not given A as well. But what you are given are many samples. And the hope is to recover both A and X simultaneously. So you are learning both the hidden basis and the representation, the sparse representation in this basis simultaneously. OK, so this is the problem. Any questions about the problem or the setting? OK, great. So there are two questions that you can ask first. OK, so when is this solution unique? When can you recover A and X from Y? Okay, so that's the identifiability problem. And the other question is, can you design polynomial time algorithms to recover the dictionary and the representation? Okay, so now, as stated, this problem, I mean, both these problems are very challenging. And the way you usually deal with, these, with both these problems is by making distributional assumptions on x. Okay, so you always would want to assume some kind of a assumption on a. You would assume that the dictionary is either incoherent or satisfies the restrictive, restricted isometry property, just because even if you are given A, to recover X uniquely, you need either, either incoherence or some such assumption. So we'll always be happy with making an assumption about the dictionary, the unknown dictionary. But uh, even to understand this uh, problem of identifiability and so on, you usually need to assume distributional assumptions about X. OK? Good. So. Uh, so what are the distributional assumptions about x? So he here you can think about this generator model for x. So you can split the process of generating x into two parts. Okay. So first you try to figure out which are the non-zero entries of x. Okay. So you can think about this distribution ds, d sub s, which generates sparse vectors, which generates k-sparse vectors. Uh, so it will generate n-dimensional k-sparse vectors. And this gives you the distribution for uh, the sparsity pattern, essentially. Okay, so just assume that every sample will have its sparsity pattern generated independently from this distribution. Okay, so uh, a simple uh, distribution to keep in mind is just that these are random, I mean, uniformly chosen among all k-sparse vectors. Okay, so, I mean, uh, yeah, typically you assume uh, a nice distribution of this form. Okay, and the second process, and the second step of the process, you now generate the non-zero values for the positions where you know, uh, for the positions that you know are non-zero. Okay, so there is this value distribution. Okay, so uh, you can think about the value distribution for now as just being plus or minus one with equal probability. In general, you may want to assume that it's a symmetric distribution which has some support in some intervals. Okay, it's a, I mean, they should be bounded away from zero because you should know which ones are zeros and which ones are non-zeros. Okay, 
but for now, you can just think of them as plus minus one with equal probability. And you assume a statistical dependence between them, or? Pardon? You assume a statistical dependence between the... Uh, yes, so you can assume, so yes, so now you just assume that each non-zero entry yeah. is drawn independently from this distribution. Oh, I see, you assume independently. Yeah, in the vanilla model, that's what you assume. Yeah. Okay, so you first figure out what the non-zero entries of X are, that is from this uh, distribution D sub S, and then you just draw all the non-zero entries according to this distribution. Okay, just think about it as plus minus one with um, probability half each. Okay, so is the model clear, the basic model clear? Okay, so now the, the, I mean, just, so now each sample is just generated from this two-step process and we just use this notation to denote the distribution generating process for each column of X. Okay, and this is just done independently again. Okay, any questions about this? Now, uh, dictionary learning has been uh, studied for a while, and there have been a lot of uh, nice guarantees uh, in, the, in the last 10 years. Uh, so these guarantees are mainly for uh, the following distribution, where you can just think of the support distribution as, again, random case pass vectors. Okay? I mean, it doesn't need to be exactly random. It can be slightly, there can be some slight dependencies, but essentially you can just think of them as being uniformly random case pass vectors. And then the value distribution, for, for this stock is also just going to be random marker variables. Okay, so plus minus one independently with probability half each. Okay, so the first provable guarantee was given, I think, was given by, I mean, computationally efficient provable guarantee was given by Spielman et al., Spielman, Wang, and Wright, uh, who showed that you can actually learn the dictionary uh, when the samples all had sparsity, which was at most root 10. Okay. But uh, there's one caveat here, which is that they needed to assume that the dictionary was not overcomplete, which means, so the way you measure overcompleteness is by uh, looking at the ratio between the number of columns and the number of dimensions. Okay, they needed to assume that the dictionary was square or thin. Okay, you really want it to be fat, so because it's an overcomplete basis, but they needed to assume that row was at most one, which means that the number of columns was less than or equal to the number of rows. Okay. So the first uh, guarantees uh, for the overcomplete regime were, were, I think, due to Arora, Ge, and Moitra, who showed that you could actually recover these dictionaries uh, even when k is, yeah, for the same range, k is being root 10, less than root 10. And this had this very nice connection to uh, detecting overlapping communities. So can you just do ICA and threshold? That's a good like question. Like ICA yes, yes. So as I have stated it here, you can think about it as an ICA problem, except that as I will mention in a little bit, these uh, these results actually deal with, you know, can tolerate some amount of dependencies. For instance, ICA, as far as I know, will not be able to handle the case when, you know, uh, you can think about the case when each coordinate is non-zero with probability k over n each, then it's completely independent. But if you think about the vector, the support vector as just being exactly k sparse, then you already lose independence. Okay, so it's already not in the ICS setting. But again, you know, all these results, uh, at least the, the second two results, will actually work by relaxing independence assumptions. They, they actually work with approximate independence and they also work with bounded independence. Okay, so I'm just making it a little easier for the talk. Okay, so simplifying it for the talk. It's a good question, yeah. Okay, and then there was uh, this uh, more recent work based on sum of squares, which will actually allow you to go to sparsity which is almost n, okay, but here you need to make some stronger assumptions about the amount of overcompleteness. So the amount of overcompleteness is only constant and it, it degrades exponentially with the amount of overcompleteness. Okay, so there are uh, a suite of nice uh, algorithms that uh, handle this dictionary learning setting. Okay, so, and there are, uh, people have also tried to get guarantees for popular heuristics like alternate minimization and so on, but a lot of these guarantees do use, do still use strong distribution assumptions about X. So both about the support and about the values. Okay, they are essentially just random. So what's the running time of these uh, SOS things? Is it polynomial time? That's a good question. So the first result was a quasi-polynomial time algorithm. 
The second result, I think, was a polynomial time algorithm as long as the sparsity is something that is slightly less than it. So maybe it's n to the 1 minus epsilon, or maybe, yeah, I think if it is n to the 1 minus epsilon, you can make it polynomial. I'm, I'm not sure. I think you should ask some of the other experts here. Yeah. I think the MSS result is polynomial time. Even for n, k being n over poly log n? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for k is polylogin? k being n over polylogin. Oh, yeah, n over polylogin should be fine, I think. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, the main thing that we are trying to uh, focus in this talk using a Samirata model is do we actually need all, uh, do we actually need these kind of strong uh, assumptions about the support of these vectors x? Okay, so the assumption is usually, I mean, that uh, it's ran the support is random and the values are random. And our question is, do we need these assumptions about the support? Okay. So we'll use a semi-random model to try to capture this kind of robustness. Okay. And our goal is to allow for almost arbitrary supports for the columns of X. <coughs> okay. As such, okay, clearly this cannot work. It cannot be completely arbitrary because you know all your columns can avoid uh, all your entries of x can always avoid the first column, in which case you never see information about the first column. So you, you of course, need a little bit of information. But you can actually show that, uh, yeah, so, uh, right, I mean, okay, so the goal is to study this kind of a semi-random model that will allow us to reason about this almost <coughs> arbitrary support pattern in x. I mean, it's more general, it'll be more general than the basic sparse coding model. And I mean, it'll also be helpful in identifying when you can hope for identifiability. I mean, in understanding when you can hope for identifiability. What are the minimal assumptions you need about supports to get identifiability? And also polytime algorithms. Okay. So, uh, good. So, we want our columns of x to be arbitrarily, uh, the supports to be arbitrarily distributed. So, no assumptions about the support. But of course, that's not possible because of some trivial reasons like this. But also, you can come up with slightly more interesting examples, okay, where uh, you know each column will have a representation, but you can kind of align them, the supports nicely in such a way that you can't hope to recover a and x. Okay. Uh, good. So, but here's a thought: What if there was just a small amount of random data? Okay. So now maybe this random data will actually make the model identifiable, and now you don't have these statistical issues, and your goal is now to just get polytime algorithms. Okay, so let me go through the model a little more slowly. So you, here's a generator model for x now. Okay, think of beta as being something that is extremely small. You can think of it as inverse polynomial. You have a bunch of samples, a few samples, from this random distribution for the supports. Okay. So beta fraction of the samples are going to be from the random distribution for supports. Okay? And the rest, 1 minus beta fraction, are completely adversarially chosen. Okay? So, and the, these adversarially chosen supports can actually look at the randomness in the, in the first few randomly chosen supports. Okay? Now, of course, all the samples are, you don't know which ones have been randomly generated and which ones have been adversarially generated. They're coming in some random order. You don't know. Uh, you don't know this. Okay. So if you knew the random sample, which were the random supports, you can just use the old algorithm with these things. Okay. And so, so how how what's the process? So, uh, the beta fraction of the supports are going to be generated from this uh, DS, which is this uh, random support distribution. Okay. And the rest of the one minus beta fraction of the columns are going to have arbitrary supports. Okay. And now the values of each of the non-zero entries are again going to be drawn from this value distribution, independently of random. Okay, so it's only trying to capture, uh, I mean, this kind of uh, adversarial nature for the supports. The values are still going to be completely random. Okay. So you should really think about this as a lot of samples with a few random supports, and most of them are being adversarial. Okay. So here's a simple claim. This semi-random model is identifiable. Okay, why is it identifiable? Well, let's just try to identify A. Why is A identifiable? Well, you can just focus on 
the random samples. You don't know which ones they are, but they're there, okay? So you can just focus on the random samples, and just from the random samples, A is identified. Okay, just because of all these earlier works. And now, once you know A, you can now recover all the columns of X just by compressive sensing. Okay, so identifiability is not an issue in the semi-random model at all, just because of the few random samples that exist. Okay. But the nice thing about this model is that the adversary can just completely overwhelm the random portion. And you, of course, don't know which is the random portion and which is the adversarial support portion. Okay, so now in, in aggregate, a lot of these statistics, I mean, uh, in aggregate, the distribution, the support distribution may just look completely arbitrary. And for a lot of the existing algorithms, which actually deal with, uh, I mean, the samples on aggregate, they fail because of this. Okay. And another uh, reason why we don't have algorithms that work in this model as such is because we don't have convex relaxations that capture sparse coding well. Okay, so uh, the situation with matrix completion and compressive sensing isn't really applicable here. Okay, so any questions about the model? So here, I'm sorry, I just want to understand. So A is, uh, doesn't have to be incoherent in the, the did you make that assumption in the generation oh, yeah. model? Yeah, 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 A you is incoherent everywhere. Yeah, yeah, so right. Because uh, if you do dictionary learning for natural images, it won't be incoherent, for example. The example you showed in your motivation. Oh, is it? Okay, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, you're probably <coughs> in next. Uh, I see. But in some sense, if you want to get a, you need some kind of an assumption. Perhaps not incoherence. Perhaps RIP is a uh, is a reasonable assumption. Okay, that's, that's the assumption. Yeah. But you need some kind of an assumption to get, ensure uniqueness of X. Otherwise, it's hopeless. Even if you know A, and you need that kind of an assumption. So uh, what is the main result in, I mean, at a high level, we give a robust polynomial time algorithm. I mean, it's robust in the sense that it works in the semi-random model. And uh, uh, it works up to sparsity of square root n. We'll go through the results uh, more carefully. But it also gives you, I mean, interestingly, uh, a couple of surprising consequences when we were studying this was that uh, this way of looking at it also helped us identify, I mean, helped us understand some minimal assumptions about the supports that are needed for identifiability. Okay, so while we are talking about the semi-random model and designing algorithms for the semi-random model, if you just go into the actual workings of the algorithm, we are able to show some very minimal assumptions under which of the supports under which it's identifiable. And uh, in fact, these algorithms, uh, in fact, gave better, I mean, be better guarantees even in the purely random model in certain regimes of parameters. Okay, so we look at this. Um, in bit. Okay, so the first result is the result for the semi-random model. Okay, so uh, assuming that the dictionary is incoherent, so it's it's a uh, little uh, it's uh, let me let me pass the result with you. So assuming that the dictionary is incoherent, and suppose you are given polynomially many samples, I'm not going to care uh, that much about what exact polynomial it is uh, from the semi-random model. Uh, with high probability, we can recover both A and X in polynomial time up to any desired accuracy. Okay, so the accuracy will just show up in the number of samples, provided the sparsity is less than the square root of n. Okay. So this is an assumption that I've written, uh, written here, but it's not really an assumption that's needed. So there's like a graceful trade-off with respect to the spectral norm of A. And the spectral norm of A is just a measure of the overcompleteness. Okay, so... Uh, there's just a polynomial dependence on this, which decays gracefully, and that's there in um, some of the earlier works as well. Okay, and note that k being less than or equal to root n is a barrier even in the purely random model if you just have the incoherence assumption. Whereas with RIP, you can hope to do better, but with just the incoherence assumption, square root n is a barrier. Okay, and we do match this uh, barrier. Yes. <clears throat> just a. Uh, does your adversary also have sparse vectors or can any vectors? Oh, no, no, I, it has to be sparse vectors. So we crucially use the fact that whatever samples are given have only sparse columns. Yeah, so it's not arbitrary vectors, it's only sparse vectors. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so a second result is actually a result for just a pure random model, okay, where the supports are actually fully random. Uh, I mean, 
it's random in the sense uh, that I'll describe uh, in a bit. Uh, so here we're going to assume there is RIP just because we want to go beyond the square root n uh, regime. And here we show that uh, with in polynomial time and samples, we can recover the dictionary up to any desired accuracy, provided the sparsity is less than n to the two-thirds. Okay. And uh, so this leads to uh, algorithms in certain new regimes because uh, the result of Aurora, Ger, and Moitra works for the sparsity being up to square root n, whereas the SOS algorithms, it goes up to n, but then you need the amount of overcompleteness to be a constant. Okay, here, here, you don't have this assumption on the amount of overcompleteness. Okay. So uh, some of these results are very incomparable in this context. Okay. okay. Is so, it, yeah. It, oh, maybe yeah, so. Uh, just to give you a sense of the results, this is just in a purely random model. And here when I say random, uh, the supports can have some approximate dependence as well. So our results can also tolerate that, uh, just as the previous works. Uh, the supports, uh, you can think, yeah, you can think of it as bounded independence and approximate bounded independence for the supports. Okay. So uh, the result of Arara, Gern, Moitra uh, can go up to square root n. Uh, I mean, if you think about it in terms of m, which is the number of columns, it's, it has this dependence. Um, you'll also lose just a little bit in terms of the amount of overcompleteness. So that's measured in terms of the spectral norm and the ratio between the number of columns and rows. Uh, so these SOS algorithms work up to little o of m, but then uh, you need the amount of overcompleteness to be a constant. And R goes up to m to the 2 thirds, but it has a worse dependence on the amount of overcompleteness than and Moitra. Okay, so it doesn't need to be constant, but it has a worse dependence. So, yeah, in different regimes, these three results are, I mean, yeah, in, are incomparable and optimal in certain regimes. They're not optimal, but they're better than certain regimes. Any questions about this? Yes. So, so you said there exists an algorithm. Are you going to? Oh, yes, I'm going to describe the algorithm. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good question, yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah, another nice consequence is the identifiability results. So we actually show identifiability all the way up to uh, little o of n, I mean, sparsity going up to uh, little, o, uh, little o of n, uh, assuming just a very weak assumption about the supports. The only thing you need about the supports is that for every three coordinates, there should be at least a few samples where all of them co-occur. Okay. So, yeah, so of course every column has to occur, otherwise you don't have any information about the column. And in fact, we can also show that you can come up with instances where, you know, every two columns co-occur, uh, but I mean, it's actually not identifiable. And, uh, but if you have this triples condition that every three columns co-occur, okay, and at least a few samples, then the model becomes identifiable, polynomially identifiable. Okay. And, uh, um, right, so but here we are assuming that it, these are Radomacher variables. Okay, and it goes all the way up to linear sparsity. Okay, good. So let me try to sketch the details of the algorithm in the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, so the two main parts of the algorithms are, you know, we have a testing procedure and a candidate generation procedure. Okay, and what is the testing procedure going to do? Well, the testing procedure assumes that you're going to be given a unit vector. Okay. Uh, which is potentially a column of the dictionary. Here we are just assuming that all the columns of the dictionary are unit vectors, okay? I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, so suppose you're given a candidate vector z, candidate unit vector z. Your task is to identify whether z is close to any of the columns or whether it's far from all the columns. Okay, so that's your task, okay? Now, this testing procedure, yeah, so it just outputs yes if z is somewhat close, think of eta as just being one over poly log n. So it's somewhat close to one of the columns or it's far from all the columns. Okay. And the second, this is, an, this is going to be an efficient procedure. And the second procedure is just a candidate generation algorithm, which will just produce many such candidate vectors z. It will just be polynomially many of them. And you'll just run all those vectors through this testing procedure and then you'll identify the columns. Okay, so two parts to the algorithm. So I'm going to mainly focus on the testing procedure because I think this is uh, a nice takeaway from this uh, talk. 
so yeah, this is the testing procedure. Again, remember you're given a unit vector z, you just need to identify whether it is far from all the columns or close to one of the columns. Okay. So here is the, uh, the theorem statement. Let me not go over it too carefully. Uh, it's just going to say with very high probability whether it is close to one of the columns or far from all the columns. And this testing procedure will go all the way up to order and sparsity. Okay. So this testing procedure is solid all the way up to order and sparsity. And in fact, I mean, I mean, while uh, it may seem like most of the work is going to go into the candidate generation process, this testing procedure is already fairly non-trivial because uh, this testing procedure will work under the triplets condition and it will immediately give you identifiability for the model. Because you're going to get this testing procedure to work with exponentially small failure probability. And now you can just take an epsilon net over all unit vectors and feed them into the testing procedure and just identify all the columns. Okay, so this testing procedure is already doing something non-trivial because it will immediately give you identifiability. Okay, and it works just under the triplets condition. Any questions about this? All right, good. So what's the testing procedure doing? It's actually very simple, okay? So suppose you are given this candidate vector z, and let's just take one of the samples y. Let's say y is a times x, okay? Now let's just take an inner product. <laughs> let's take the inner product between the sample y and this candidate column z. Okay, let's say, suppose this candidate vector, unit vector z was actually one of the columns, okay? Then you can just split out the sum as uh, y inner product with z is exactly xj times the inner product between aj and aj, that's 1 because the unit vector, plus uh, a summation over all the other coordinates xi times ai inner product with aj. Okay, I'm just writing it out. So the nice thing is that xj for us is only going to be either plus or minus 1, but the remaining portion is really a mean 0 random variable because all the xi's are a mean zero, symmetric random variables, and it'll have low variance, okay? Just because of incoherence or RIP, okay? So what this tells you is that if Z is one of the true columns, then all these inner products are gonna be either close to one or minus one, okay? If XJ is one or minus one, or it's gonna be close to zero. And this is really gonna be the test. So if it, if it were actually, uh, true column, if you just look at the histogram of the inner products between Z and all the samples, then you'll really see this kind of a histogram where all the inner products have magnitude which is either close to zero or close to one. But there will be a non-negligible number of samples which have an inner product that's close to one. Okay, just from the random part, or you know, you just need that column to occur. Okay, so this will be our testing uh, procedure. You just look at the distribution of these inner products and uh, we'll try to just see if the distribution is bimodal, okay? So if it is actually close to one of the columns, then it is actually bimodal in the sense. But if it is far from one of the columns, this is the hard part. You want to show that it's actually spread out, okay? And why is it spread out? Well, uh, yeah, so this is the testing procedure. And once you, you do this, you can just, uh, uh, if it passes the checks, you can just take some averages over all samples and you can amplify the accuracy and so on. But why does this testing procedure work? Well, the soundness really relies on this uh, key lemma, which is actually a pretty simple lemma, which just says that suppose you have uh, a sum of these independent Rademacher variables, okay? And uh, suppose I tell you, uh, let's say that the variance is normalized to one, okay? Suppose I tell you that the sum takes a value which is I mean, which lies in some interval which is close to t. Think of t as being much larger than one, with some probability at least kappa, okay? Uh, then it is also gonna take a value which is somewhat smaller, okay? Let's say between 0.1t and 0.3t, with some probability which is at least some constant times kappa. Okay, so if it takes a value which is in an interval around t with some non-negligible probability, it is also going to take a value, the absolute value of the inner product, it's also going to take a value which is somewhat smaller with non-negligibility, non-negligible probability as well. Okay, and this is kind of a challenge when kappa is very small. If kappa is large, so you should really think of, if kappa is large, t is somewhat small, 
And you can just use central limit theorems to argue that this will happen with not, I mean, reasonable probability. The challenge is when kappa is actually very small. It's like inverse polynomial in n. Okay, and that is the kind of probability that we are dealing with because our success probability is k over m, which is inverse polynomial in n. And here, the way we prove this is by using some kind of a coupling argument. There is a simple direct coupling argument, but you either do this coupling argument or uh, use a central limit theorem to show that this is true. Okay, so this will show the soundness, and soundness will argue that if it is not close to any of the columns, then you will actually see a spectrum. You'll see it spread out between 0 and 1. So you'll see values between 0 and 1. Okay, so, uh, so this is the... So this L, the number of summons, how is it related to... So that will be the support of the sparse vector. So it's not N. But some polynomial. So basically 1 yeah. by root L would be sort of the trivial. Exactly. Uh, it will come from the central limit theorem. Yeah, exactly. But then these quotients may also not be uh, uniform and things. So central limit theorem will also depend on the, the maximum coefficient, which could be somewhat large. Okay, so there's also the candidate uh, generation procedure, which is actually pretty simple. It just takes uh, weighted sums of all the samples, but you do this weighting a little more cleverly, and I'm not gonna go into it. Proving that this candidate generation algorithm works is a lot more technical, uh, because you need to then argue that with some non-negligible probability, you'll get a vector that is somewhat close to a column, and that requires some concentration bounds for uh, low degree polynomials of some rarely occurring random variables. Uh, and so that's the two parts of the algorithm. I'm, I'm actually going to stop here and not going to go into the clustering Gaussian mixtures. But clearly, there is uh, room for discussion. And you should just come and ask me about uh, the random semi-random model for clustering Gaussians, if you're interested. Questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, oh, good, good, good. Yes, yes. So I, I did not go into that. So the test, so the identifiability result is not computation. So it doesn't go up to, I mean, we don't know, I don't know an algorithm, at least our algorithm doesn't work under just the triples condition. It meets the semi random model because we don't have an algorithm that generates these candidates <laughs> under just the triples condition. Identifiability in polynomial time, is there a theorem known? Like, what is the minimal necessary and sufficient condition for identifiability in polynomial time analysis? No, I don't think this is well understood. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think before this uh, identifiability result, to the best of my knowledge, the only identifiability results that were known were through algorithms. And I don't think identifiability is, I mean, yeah, that well understood. I mean, this gives some characterization, but yeah, this is still a pretty open terrain. Thank you. Yeah. It would be yeah. fascinating if, if this can work for rational images, for example. You're proposing a binary code for, for very complex signals, right? Yeah. Um, I need so to. So your, your uh, activities are, are one and minus one. Yes. Oh, I see. OK, yeah, that's. So basically, uh, if you. I mean, the dictionary you, you will learn, like for the example you put up on natural images, would be very, very different, assumably. I see. Yeah, anyways. Yeah, no, we should I talk see. about this, yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions? Do you have a conclusion slide? Oh, yes, okay, let me, let me do that, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there is this semi random GMM model where, I mean, I can tell you about it offline, yeah. Well, the, the, the punchline there is that <laughs> Lloyd's algorithm works under the semi-random model, and this is based on an analysis by Kumar and Kannan. Um, it's a very, really nice work. And it just shows that under this semi-random model for Gaussians, Lloyd's algorithm works, whereas we don't know if a lot of the other algorithms that we know for clustering <coughs> Gaussians works. So that is perhaps an explanation for uh, you know, the, why it's so successful. And, I mean, but I'm not saying that the semi-random model is super realistic or something. Uh, in general, I think it will be very nice to understand these kind of semi random models for other unsupervised learning problems. And a concrete <coughs> problem that I don't know is whether you can actually hit uh, n, sparsity n, either for the semi random model or for the purely random model when the amount of overcompleteness is not just a constant but much larger. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. 
All right. If there is no other question, we go for coffee.